The first question is, really, we think about cells having a natural lifespan. You know, they call it the Hayflick limit, the, you know, a certain number of doublings. And this is because telomeres, which are the caps of these chromosomes, get shorter and shorter and shorter and leave the DNA vulnerable. And the, what you discovered was that this is a reversible process in some ways. Yes, so uh, this wasn't completely inevitable, this wearing down of the telomeres as the cells replicate, because uh, what I did, and my student Carol Greider at UC Berkeley many years ago discovered that there is an enzyme that can build back the telomeres, and you would have thought problem solved, excepting unfortunately we humans don't seem to have quite enough of this, and so it's a bit of a race between what wears down and what um, can build back up again. And certain organisms like pond scum, right? Hydra, yes. vulgaris, the, these invertebrates that live on ponds, uh, they seem to be able to renew forever. Yes, right. right. We found the enzyme telomerase in, in effectively an organism that can just multiply forever and ever. Like we used to say, you could feed it and talk nicely to it, and it would keep multiplying for you. So we figured if there was going to be an enzyme like this, that perhaps we would find it in this very unlikely little organism. And so we went hunting for it and found it. And then the long story that evolved was, well, how does it all play out in humans? Do we have enough of it? And where is it? And what does it do for us? cell renewal. Now, one of the problems is, is that there's something else that uses telomerase to grow and stay essentially immortal, which is cancer cell. Which is cancer. So now we come across the great trade-off in humans, right. which is, yes, it's great to have enough telomerase for our renewing cells, like our blood cells and our hair and our skin and our gut lining and all the things we want to keep renewing and refreshing throughout life. But guess what else loves to keep renewing itself? And that is cancer cells. So the big unknown was how would that play out in humans? And there was no way you could predict from mouse models or from you know small animal models what the balance would be. So you had to look in us. And the answer was uh, mostly having this maintenance is good, but there are a few situations. If telomerase gets pushed up a little bit too much, then it tips you into the danger of certain cancers. But overall, overall, if you look 40,000 feet up, uh, you know, down at humanity and say, what's better? The balance is overall to uh, keep the telomeres better maintained than otherwise. So I think the trick is going to be to find out where the vulnerable uh, vulnerabilities to a little bit too much telomere maintenance is and become a little more precision medicine oriented about where we know. So what we do at the moment is say, let's just make recommendations for people in general, which we know are safe because we see them better maintaining telomeres. So they're things Essentially what your mother told you, exercise, sleep well, have a good attitude, <laughs> eat decent food. Right. And, uh, so we just rediscovered all of these things again. But, quantify but it sounds the, better backed up by science. That's much, much right. better. Okay. That's right. so, so we could quantify the telomere maintenance right. preservation, and that gives you a tool for how will you choose the best interventions. Now, what's really interesting is you're not talking about living forever. You're not talking no. about this. No. You're really talking about... Get, reaching an old age that is a healthy old age and, and yes. basically yes. staying free from the diseases of old age or mostly free from those as late as you possibly can. That's absolutely crucial, yes. I think there's genetic programs in humans that probably are looking like they're limiting us for you know 100 plus, 120 years, something like that. So it's really all about the susceptibility to the diseases of old age, some of which you can attribute to a contribution from this telomere shortening. So if we can maximize that by the ways that we know we can measure how well telomeres get um, maintained in populations, in cohorts of people, so we get good, reliable statistics, then we have a guidepost as to what kinds of things will help us the most get to you know, that good old age where we can die of what will be our, you know, well, I think there's a lot of genetic programming in that. Now, so it's only one aspect. Now you've written a age. book on this with Alyssa Eppel, who uh, is a UCSF uh, professor of psychiatry. And I normally would not hawk a book like this, but I'm sure this is going to be a bestseller. Well, it's called The Telomere <laughs> Effect, The New Science of Living Younger. And why this is so important is that you talk about 
how we can actually relive our lives to have healthier telomeres. Well, we realized that it gave us a guidepost to guide all sorts of decisions we're trying to make about how do we eat, how do we exercise, do, you know, what do we need for optimal sleep. And we realized that when you measure telomeres and see how well they're being maintained, it, it gives you a kind of reliable statistical criterion to use, because often it's so hard to know. So we just put all of this together in, in a book, because it was studies in all sorts of journals, you know, dozens and dozens of sto cohorts and population studies. So we thought, Let's put it all in one book. And my wonderful colleague, Alyssa Apple, who is a psychologist by training and really, really thinks about how things that we do influence our physiology and therefore our health, um, Alyssa uh, was able to combine her knowledge with my knowledge of how telomeres work. Right. And uh, so we, we, we put together this book because we really sort of cared about sharing this well, I want to raise some of these things, too, but I just want everyone to know that I'm going to be going to questions very soon because we really do want to have more engagement. Um, and so, but one of the interesting things is the sort of threat response, this, yes. our, our response yes. to stress. And yes. you talk about the difference of having a threat response versus a challenge response. Yes. Yeah. And that, that can affect the length of our telomeres. So this was so fascinating to me because, you know, I came to this from very much molecular, it was all genes and molecules and cells, and my colleague Alyssa came to me in the early 2000s and said, what happens to people who are in this long, stressful situation of having a chronically ill child and constantly not knowing what was going to happen? It was really a long-term threatening situation for the mother, the caregiver in this case. And to our amazement, there was a relationship between how bad this was and how long it was, and that went to more and more studies of stress. And then, I, you know, so I've learned all this, that stress you can sort of regard as challenge stress, you know, so we're here on the stage, challenge, little stress, challenge, as opposed to threat stress where it's out of your control, you can't, you know, predict what's going to happen, it's often very prolonged, and that's put under the heading of threat. And we realized that was the one that was quantitatively bearing relationship to the degree of telomere shortness observed in multiple cohorts. For example, we talked about Alzheimer's. We didn't talk about the family members who are often the long-term mm. carers. We're looking at long-term family situations with um, a child with autism spectrum disorder in the family, long-term stressful situations, mm. seeing quantitative relationships and realizing this is really telling us we have to be looking after the whole family, the whole communities, not only those who are ostensibly sick, but around them, we, we have you know, so real evidence real. of responsibilities that we can read out in this way. Um, any questions? Any, anything from the audience? Oh, we've got one right up front and then, um, and then right there in the middle. Um, hi. hi, Nishina Asaria with LifeQ. I wonder um, if your research has led to any digital health services that are actually measuring and monitoring physiology and psychology of these individuals or families or even communities and, yeah. and mm -hmm. seeing results from the digital health services. Um, I myself am very much a research lab based person so I can't, you know, I, I can't claim to have done that at all but certainly my colleague uh, Alyssa Apple, my co-author, and others really, I think, are very, very interested in these sorts of things that can help people with the kinds of things we heard about earlier in regard to fitness, how you can help self-monitor and cue yourself to um, be aware of things that are going on in you. But, but I'm really a basic scientist, you know, and all this came from absolutely fundamental mm. basic research, and I think that's really key. You know, we mustn't forget that this wasn't for aging. In fact, I used to avoid aging research like the plague. You know, I, I just thought it was just, you know, it wasn't going to be easy at all. And our research led us through the basic science into this whole question of what plays out over the decades and decades of human life. So the quick answer is others are doing it. I personally don't lay claim to it, but I can see that when you combine that with you know measures that you can do in cohort studies and get reliable statistics, that this will be very valuable tools. So I hope those kinds of things get developed. Peter, yeah, yeah. Um, over here, yeah. I think it's very interesting what you're talking about. I, I was reading last week in I think it was in the Financial Times 
that they assume the over age of cells is 115 years old and that's kind of the maximum and then there are other professors who say we can get 150 years old <laughs> and we have also heard about the whales that yes. doesn't age where they try to copy the cells from this whale that can get 200 years old what is your view on you know this whole aging of cells and regeneration of cells well um there's a lot more that goes on in aging the cells besides telomeres. I didn't emphasize it's only one aspect. You know, proteins get old and sort of fuzzy in cells, and some proteins don't go away, uh, you know, for example, in brain cells. So uh, I, I think that, you know, f let's take our germ lineages, the cells that give rise to generations and generations and generations. Clearly, they can produce progeny cells that are just fine, or we wouldn't be here, right? But the question of an individual cell and its age, there are cells that sit in our brains for a long time, and then there are some that renew. So the, the, there's no simple one answer, but one thing we do know is that at least the cells have got to maintain good telomeres because that protects all the genetic material. And, um, and then in terms of human age, I think you were saying, you know, what, what could we expect for human ages? And, you know, the maximum time for a known human is about 120 years. So that's, you know, that's a lot of people who've been sampled. And so that's clearly pushing a pretty high limit. Maybe we could get it to, you know, 25% better, you know, 150. But I really don't know that we have any indication that that's ever happened. But, you know, maybe. <laughs> but I'm not one of these people who think that the human organism, which is so complex, so many interlocking parts that have to be traded off one against the other, you know, self-renewing versus cancer, for example, I'm not convinced that that's going to be an easy road to push that out. So I'm not really that interested in our research. Uh, our research just took us to let's get us through the life, you know, the life range that we have and hope that our health span is as close as possible to our, our lifespans.